Good Wednesday evening to each and every one of you. Glad you could join us uh, to hear a portion of God's Word. I know I will be uh, excited uh, when we are able to gather uh, physically together again. I know I have missed it um, and really hope that we will be able to soon. Uh, just pray for the situation, pray for uh, wisdom, guidance, and direction uh, that we all may make the best choice uh, and the choice that God would have us to make because that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to make the choice that God would have us to make. So may we each pray for wisdom and uh, leadership as well as uh, we go down this road. Thank you each for traveling it with us this far. You know, uh, I've grown a large amount uh, just in the last couple of weeks. I've grown spiritually. I've grown closer to God. I've got a uh, just a slightly clearer picture of the world. It seems a little bit smaller now, but a bigger view of God. I have, uh, my, my mind has been opened up to avenues about how uh, to reach a lost and dying world even more effectively. I hope I'm not the only one that has grown during this time, but I hope you have grown as well. I think this is a time for growth for each and every one of us. Thank you again for your cooperation. If you need anything, please do not hesitate to reach out uh, to our leadership and you can find us at www.bethelparis.org. You can find all of our videos on there as well. Don't forget our service schedules uh, to, tonight as we do the adults right now at 7. Uh, the youth will follow at 8 o'clock. Tune in for that. Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Uh, a.m. and then at 6 o'clock p.m. Again, we tested out a new platform on Tuesday uh, and it seemed to work really well uh, on our YouTube and our Facebook. So we'll probably use that same platform uh, for Wednesday uh, for the youth and for this coming up Sunday. So we're really excited about that uh, and this platform that we are using. Prayer request again, all those that are affected, um, pray for... Um, uh, those uh, in, in, in our families, those in the whole world, in our nation, in our state, uh, even our local, our businesses, uh, teachers, uh, all, all those uh, that are, have been affected by this. Let's continue to pray for them. All those in the healthcare field uh, that are dealing with this as well, let's be in prayer for them. Pray for our church. Uh, pray for the many on our prayer list. Uh, if you need a copy of that, please let me know I can, and, and I can get that to you. Uh, again, just to mention uh, some, uh, Jack and Edna Lee, uh, Jim Richardson, Guy Davis, Christy Fisher, uh, the Angie Rice family. May we be in prayer for them. And it, that leads me to this. This would be a great time to reach out to those on our prayer list, to reach out to uh, our church family, to give them a call, to encourage them, to Connect and grow closer together. Do that. Send cards. Encourage each other. Most importantly, as we're talking about prayer, don't forget to pray. Do not forget to talk to God during this time to pray. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. May the United States of America, may the world be driven to their knees and pray to Almighty God. At this time, again, before we go into a word of prayer, before we go into this time of God's Word, uh, may you turn off distractions. May you gather around uh, your device and have a worship service with your family. Have a time of concentration to the Word. Open up your minds, open up your hearts just shortly. At this time, would you join me in a word of prayer? God, we ask your blessings on this service. 
We ask that You use this time for Your honor and Your glory. That You bless the preaching of Your Word. That it is used to sharpen us. To grow us. God, with all my heart, With everything I have at this moment, I pray for Bethel Church. Pray for every member. They are comforted. They have peace. They find rest in Jesus Christ. Lord, that we stay strong that we grow during this time. God, I pray for Your local church. I pray for all the churches that are going through these times and making these making tough decisions, God. Every aspect of the operation, God, every aspect of the Christians' lives that make up the uh, many local churches, God, I pray for them. I pray for our nation. I pray for our world. God, as days go by, God, may we have comfort in acknowledging that You are sovereign over all, that You are the first and the last, that You are in the future. May we find comfort in knowing that You are in control. Father, we love You so much. Thank You for Your Son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation we have in Him. And it's in His precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. And amen. Okay, uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. We're just going to continue that, our study in the book of Acts. Um, so if you would, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 27. Uh, and before we go to uh, our first slide, I just want to say a little bit to catch us up where we are. Uh, we're in the 27th chapter of Acts. We've been going through the book, so excited. Uh, we've only got uh, about a chapter and a half, and we'll be through the book of Acts. Uh, it's, it has been a just a wonderful study on Wednesday night. So Paul... Um, has been in Caesarea. He has gotten on a ship uh, headed to Rome as a prisoner uh, to uh, appear before Caesar uh, Nero uh, to uh, have him hear Paul's case. So Paul is a prisoner of Rome and he got on a ship and is being shipped to Rome. We'll go again in Acts chapter 27. Go to our first slide, you can see the, I think the main theme of really Acts chapter 27 and about uh, verse 15 of chapter 28 or so is journeying with God, that the overview of all this is a journey with God. Now if we'll go uh, to our first slide, I want to show you uh, the map. I want to show you the map. So he starts at Caesarea, and uh, east of Caesarea, to the right of Caesarea, that's Jerusalem. So you will kind of understand where Israel is uh, and have a perspective of where they left off from. So he gets on a ship at Caesarea. If we'll remember from verse 1, Luke uh, joins him, uh, the writer of the book of Acts, as well as one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. So Paul, they love Paul, they love the mission, and they wanted to be with Paul. So they get uh, on the ship with him in Caesarea. If we'll remember, the leader of the ship is a centurion named Julius uh, that is leading this voyage. So they head off there and they go to Sidon. You'll see that's just north of Caesarea. That's their first stop. There, Paul visits some Christians. The centurion allows him to do so. They get back on the ship and they sail north. Then they hit the uh, coastline of Asia, uh, Cilicia uh, and Pamphylia. 
and they sail east to west, and they arrive at Myra. They arrive at the town of Myra. Now, this first leg of the journey from Caesarea to Myra is smooth sailing. Things go well. Things are going as planned. And we equated that to times in our life where uh, we have smooth sailing, where things are going well for us. But we all always know that there's times of smooth sailing, but then there will always be times of hard sailing in our life. And that's the next leg of the journey. Now, if we'll go to the next slide. Once they're in Myra, they get on a, a larger ship, a ship, um, uh, Egyptian grain ship headed to Rome. Again, the centurion Julius is uh, still in charge of this ship. There, there's about 276 people on the ship. We'll see that in our text tonight. Uh, so then they begin to head east to west, uh, and they're kind of wanting to go north. Uh, and right when they get to Sinitus, uh, the winds start going against them. So they begin to drift south. They can't go against the winds anymore. Uh, and they, as they keep going south with the wind, with the north wind, they go to the island of Crete, go to the east side of Crete. You'll see there, Simone. They go to the east side of it. They go right under the island of Crete to avoid the wind. And they land at a place called Fair Havens. So really from Myra to Fair Havens is the second leg of the journey. And that's hard sailing. The winds were contrary, but yet with uh, effort, with um, some dedication, they were able to successfully hit land. So we, we kind of equated that to times in our life of uh, rough sailing, of hard sailing, that there is times in our life that are, that are hard, that are rough, but if we rely on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to guide us and to direct us, that we can get through those hard times. But it's the decisions we make during hard times that will either say we'll get through it or it will lead to impossible sailing. We get ourselves into trouble. And that's the next leg of the journey. Before we go to the next slide, again, Fair Havens, kind of ironically, that is a fair place of refuge, a good place to stay. But they did not want to stay there. They wanted to head down west on the island of Crete just a few miles to get a better place to winter. Paul says, do not go any further. Paul says, we need to stay here. This is not the right season for sailing. Uh, it won't be safe. We need to stay in fair havens until winter is done. But the leadership on the ship decided not to listen to Paul. They decided that they wanted to go ahead and make the decision to uh, head down the shore to Crete. If we go to the next slide... They wanted to go to Phoenice, or Phoenix, also called. So you see their intended was just hug the coast of Crete to get there just a few miles. So they start uh, heading that way uh, in verse um, 27, verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So they thought they had made it. They thought they were going to do well. Yes, we have uh, left Fair Havens to be more comfortable in Phoenice. But all of a sudden in verse 14, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon, a uh, northeasterly wind. And all of a sudden uh, things just go bad and they have to just give in to the winds. It's a great storm, uh, winter storm, if they are blown south 25 miles. Miles. If we'll go to the next slide, this is the main slide tonight where our text is. You can get an idea of the, where the Adriatic Sea is, where they are. And you can see Clada, that's the island south of Crete that they first came to. And then this is where they spent the two weeks, the 14 days in the middle of this sea being tossed to and fro as they get to the island of Malta. Now, if we'll go to the next slide to get a better picture of Malta to Rome, where they would eventually end up in verse in chapter 28. And then one more slide, you can get a bigger view of the whole world. Uh, well, the whole world, but this area, region of the world. Jerusalem over here to your right in the far east, and then the Rome in the top left, west. You can see this journey where they are. Okay, thank you for the slides.
So that's where we are. Uh, we're in verse 16. We'll start in verse number 16. Things go from bad to worse. From bad to worse. They are at uh, Fair Havens. They want to sell to Phoenix, but the winds are against them. They go 25 miles south. Verse 16. And running under a certain island, which is called Clada, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. So during this, again, this is a, the crew's exhausted. It's a big storm. They're blowing. Uh, the winds are blowing. It's raining. So they take three precautionary measures to help the ship not crash. The first one uh, at Clada is they, and they go under this island to protect themselves from the wind to get just a temporary relief. Uh, so they are able to take these precautionary measures. The first thing we see is the Bible says they had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up. So uh, the lifeboat is what that's talking about. You know the small boat that's attached to large ships that people can jump in and get out and, and, and row ashore or uh, go ashore. And that's the boat they're talking about that uh, they said they brought it into the ship. But it said with much effort. Uh, it said much work had to be come by the boat. Uh, likely, this is because it was filled with rain, it was filled with water, and they didn't want their the, their lifeboat to drown. So with much work, they pulled that lifeboat in, uh, pulled it up, maybe dumped the water out somehow, and brought it back in the ship. So that's the first precautionary measure they took under the cover of Clada. The next thing uh, that they did in verse 17 is they used helps undergirding the ship. This procedure is known as frapping. It involved wrapping cables around the ship's hull and then winching them tight. Uh, this would help protect the ship from the storm and the waves. Then the third precautionary measure they took uh, is they strike sail and so were driven. This striking sail, uh, looking at the uh, Greek, they took up equipment or they let down equipment. Probably mean, it means lowered equipment, so it probably likely refers to a drift anchor that they let down from the ship uh, to help the ship not go in the wind far as, as much that it would kind of create drag for the ship. And they wanted to do this because if you look in verse 17, it says, Fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, they strike sail and so were driven. Now, the quicksands... Uh, also known as uh, Sirtis, was a dreaded graveyard of ships along the North African coast that they knew about. They knew that it was south. Now, it was about 400 miles south of them, but uh, they were still, fe still fearful that if the wind kept blowing them south, the storm kept blowing them south, that they would likely shipwreck. They would likely uh, die from that. So they were taking precautionary measures. Now, this tells us a little bit about the storm because if they're worried about going 400 miles south, the storm must be a pretty big deal. They take these three precautionary measures and in verse 18, and when we are exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship. Things go from bad to worse and they're getting worse and worse and worse. Now they have to start throwing cargo. They take the three precautionary measures one day. The next day, they have to start chunking cargo to lighten the ship so hopefully the, they won't crash. They're having to throw stuff off the ship. 19, and the third day, we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So the day, the day after that, that, they even threw out the tackling with their own, own hands. Now the tackling with their own hands, probably refers to the main yard, it was called. The main yard, which was connected to the main sail, the long spar. And that's indicated, it says they used their own hands, that it was probably this big, heavy, uh, beam-like thing that they would all spar, that they would all have to pick up and then throw off the boat. Uh, so this is uh, another precautionary measure that they took to lighten the ship. So through this, the, the winds are getting worse, the storm's getting worse, they don't, they're don't. they throwing stuff uh, above ship, they're worried, they're not eating. 
in verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They hadn't seen the the sun or stars in many days. It had been black, it had been raining, it had been stormy. They were disoriented, disgruntled. They were depressed. They had no idea where they were when you sailed the stars and the sun help you understand where you were going and where you were. They hadn't seen that. They had no idea where they were. They were, uh, the storm kept raging on. Uh, they were despondent. Uh, they had not been eating. They were physically and mentally uh, affected and they lost hope and they said there's no way that we will be saved. There is no way that we're going to get out of this. They had lost all hope. With the storm raging on, with sailing impossible, what would they do? We're going to see Paul taking a leadership role next. Paul stepping up and taking a leadership role. Paul's leadership can be seen in verse 21 through 26. We'll see Paul's leadership. Verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. They have There had been a long time without eating. They had went a long time without eating food. This was likely for several reasons. Number one, they were probably seasick. Uh, two, they were depressed and upset. They probably didn't feel like eating. Uh, they were exhausted. Uh, one, the food supply was probably pretty low. So several things... Um, attributed to the them not eating. So Paul, again, at the probably very low time, morale is at its lowest ebb. Paul stands up and speaks to the crew. They're malnourished. They lost all hope. Paul wants to get the morale back up. And the first thing Paul does is it's kind of like an uh, I told you so statement. We'll talk about that. Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. So it's almost like an I told you so, but I don't think he said it in a braggadocious, I don't think he said it in a prideful manner. I think uh, what he was doing was just trying to, uh, again, get the point across that uh, I do know what I'm talking about and trying to gain some respect and a leadership status. He, he was worried about them and wanted uh, them to understand and to respect him. He wanted to make sure he had the attention and the respect of all who was listening. It says, uh, we have gained this harm and lost. He acknowledged it was a disaster. He acknowledged that they weren't in very good things and they had lost a lot of physical things. They would even lost their sailing distance and lost time. It was a disaster. So here's what Paul does. Next, after, um, after exerting his leadership, he says, now I exhort you to be of good cheer. I exhort you to have courage. That's what we need now. We need courageous people. He says, you need to have courage. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. So I want to just stop there and talk a little bit about the steps Paul take and how we can apply that to our life. There is an old saying and a preacher friend shared it with me one time, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I've shared it before. When everybody else is losing their head, keep yours. When there's chaos and uproar all around you, stay calm, cool, and collected. Be the leader in that time. Because there's no good when you lose all hope, when you're fearful, scared, running around. You're not making good decisions. You're not thinking rationally. But Paul, he's calm, he's cool, he's collected. He stands up and he says, we don't need to lose hope, but we need to have courage during this time. We need to have courage. I think in bad times in our life, that's what we need. We need courage. Take courage. Be of good cheer. We'll not do anything in a despondent state, but in a courageous state. Paul shows a good example 
He says, and here's the reason I think you need to be of good cheer. There's no, nobody's going to lose their life but of the ship. Nobody's going to die here today, boys. We're going to make it. Nobody's going to die. Nobody's going to lose their life. The ship, we're not. Uh, it's going to be gone. We're going to lose it, but nobody's life. Now, let's stop there. At this moment, they have got to be thinking, Paul, you're out of your mind. Why do you think this? How, how in the world are we, oh, none of us are going to die, but the ship is going to be lost. What are you talking about? How can that be? Well, Paul's message to them about them not losing their life was really not Paul's message at all. It was God's message and Paul was the messenger. We'll see that next in the next verse, 23. He said, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Wow. He says, An angel came there uh, to me. God sent a messenger. God sent a message to me. And that's how I know we are not going uh, to uh, die. Go to verse 24, saying, Fear not. We see angels do this throughout Scripture. When they come to people and they have a message, they always say, Fear not. Do not fear. A messenger of God. Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given with all them that sail with thee. He says nobody's going to die. Go back up to 23. I want to point something else out. He says, The angel came to me, that night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Now, think about this. People are going crazy. They've lost all hope. They've thrown things overboard. They have no idea where they are. There's no stars. There's no sun. They Everybody thinks they're going to die. Paul stands up. Everybody's hungry. Nobody's eating. Paul stands up and says, One, an angel came to me. God gave me a message. But then he says... Throughout all this, through the heart, one of the hardest times, he says, Whom I am. He says, Let me tell you the first thing. I am God's. I'm his precious possession. It does not matter what circumstance I am, I am God, and he loves me, and he's going to take care of me one way or the other. God gave me a promise. Let me tell you something. God gave Paul a promise that they would make it and that everybody had their life, and Paul believed that promise. And I think we can learn something from that in our life. That God's Word and the promises that He's given to us, no matter the circumstances around us, no matter uh, the, uh, the, what we cannot see up above, no matter our view, we, we think all hope is lost, we can't see anything, Yet we must trust the promises and word of God at all times. Don't lose that faith. Don't lose that hope. God's word is true in all circumstances of life. Paul knew that. Paul trusted God's word. We need to too. But also, he acknowledged, I'm God's. I'm a child of God. And if you are saved, you are a child. You are his possession. You've been bought with a price. You're not your own. You're God's. And he says, whom I serve, that I serve God in the valleys and the mountains. I serve God in the raging storm and in the sunshine on dry land. I will serve God any time I serve Him now. We must serve God with all we have through the storms, through the good times, through the bad times. We are God's and we must serve Him. I love Paul's attitude and he made that known to them. He says in verse 24, again, not to fear. Paul, you're going to not only go to Rome, but you're going to appear before Caesar. So that's a promise. And then God, not only you, but all them that are in the ship with you, God's given them to you. God's going to take care of them. That's how Paul is assured that they will make it. Verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, again, be courageous, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told to me. Again, he believed the message of God. I love that. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Next, there's a prospect of landing. 
a prospect of landing. Verse 27, But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were, in, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. So we are two weeks in of uh, ups and downs of a storm. They have been 14 days in this sea, raging back and forth, up and down. And it's midnight. It's in the middle of the night one night that uh, the the men of the ship thought that they had drawn near to, to land, to some country. So likely, number one, visibility was not good. There's a storm, it's dark, and it's midnight. So it's not. I don't think they saw land. I think they probably heard waves crashing into rocks. Uh, we're going to see that uh, example. Verse 29, Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks. So they likely heard some kind of wave striking rocks, uh, the, ge the, the geography around uh, Malita. So they had perceived they had, uh, the hope of, of landing was uh, coming uh, to materialize. Paul's statement was coming to materialize. So with that suspicion, they did some techniques to find out how deep things were, verse 28, and sounded... And that's the technique they used to figure out how deep it was and found it 20 fathoms, so 120 feet. Where they dropped, what they did, it was 120 feet where they were. And they kept sailing. When they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms, which was 90 feet. So they realized they were getting shallower and shallower, again indicating they were drawing close to land. Then fearing, lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. So they take uh, four anchors and out of the back, the stern of the ship, they drop them so they could control the front of the ship. And it says after that, they wish for day. It's midnight. They hope they can make it to the day so they can see land and know where to go and not crash into the rocks. Interesting that the King James Version says the word wish for day in 29. I think it's purposeful. The Greek word is translated prayer, eukoma, a lot of times. But I, these, these sailors, and it's going to show a little bit about their faith here in a minute. These sailors weren't praying to God. I think they were just wishing or they were, pra they were pagan. A lot of them were, most of them were pagans. They were probably praying to their false gods, wishing them that they would get through this. Now, they would ultimately get through this, but it wasn't because of their false ideas of God, their false gods. It was because of the one true God, the only God that would get them through this. But they wished for a day. Paul had already told them that they were going to make it, that nobody was going to die. They didn't trust it at that time. They didn't trust God. They didn't trust the message from God. They wish for day. Well, wishing does not uh, do a whole lot, does it? Wishing does not do a whole lot, but God is in control. We've got to trust God, trust His Word, and pray. Not to anything, not, not uh, wishing in a worldly way that we toss a coin in a wishing well and we hope something comes true. Well, that, that, just, that just doesn't work. Nothing's going to happen with a coin in a wishing well. But we must pray to the one true God. Prayer is powerful. We acknowledge who God is and call out to Him. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. So we see they didn't have faith. They were about to take that boat, that lifeboat they'd brought in days earlier, and they they were under uh, pretense. They they said they'd go, they'd went to the front of the ship to drop the sails, uh, to drop the anchors. Excuse me, but that's not what they did. It they did that so a lot of the crew were going to jump in the lifeboat and try to get to land uh, by day. They were scared. They thought they were going to crash. So uh, they said, we're going up here. We're going to drop the anchors off the front of the ship. That's not what they're doing. They were trying to jump in the lifeboat, go to land. They did not have faith in God and His message and in His words. So they were trying to take matters in their own hands. 
Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except the abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. He, see, he goes to the leader of the centurion. He says, uh, with leadership, and the centurion's going to listen to him. We'll, probably, we'll see that next week. But he says, listen, if these men leave, we're going to have less men on the ship. Okay, we're probably not going to survive. Next, the men leave. They're probably not going to survive. Listen, this crew, the ship's not going to be saved. If they go, tell them not to go. We've got to trust God, trust His provision, and trust His Word. That brings me to my last application. Last couple applications tonight. When things are really bad, we can't see the outcome. We have no idea what the future holds. We don't need to be quick to try to lose faith and take things in our own hands. To try to control the outcome on our own to get the lifeboat and try to do it our way. When we start trying to force matters and do that, bad things will happen. What we've got to do is rest in God, be still and know that I'm God. I love that. Be still and know that I'm God. Trust His provision and His hand and His promise and His protection and wait upon the Lord. That's what these people in the ship in this storm need to do. And that's what we need to do in this storm we're in. Wait upon God. Be still and know that I am God. The Bible tells us. Be still and know that God is in control. Trust the Word that He's given us. Trust the Word that He's given us. The last thing. Well... Number one, again, we look at this whole picture, this whole uh, journey. It's a journey with God. God's in control. God's overall. He's in control of the whole journey. He's got. He's going to take care of the, the Paul and the people. God's going to take care of us. He always has. And He certainly has taken care of us for all eternity. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the last thing in that verse in uh, 31. It says, except the abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. It says, unless you stay here in this physical ship, you'll die physically. But let me tell you this. Except you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you cannot be saved from the wrath to come. You cannot be saved from eternal separation from God in a place called hell. It is only through the Lord Jesus Christ, His work on the cross, His blood, his forgiveness that we can be saved. Without Him, we cannot be saved. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? There will be no eternity in heaven. There will be no forgiveness of sins apart from Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man goes to the Father but by Him. Are you saved? I, I urge and I exhort, I plead with you today that if you've never accepted Jesus Christ in a person, so you do so right now where you're at. You'll, by the whole, guided by the Holy Spirit of God, acknowledge that you are a sinner. Acknowledge that God did provide a sacrifice for that sin, a provision for that sin. That was His perfect Son, Jesus Christ, sinless died on the cross for that sin, took upon your sin, was buried in a tomb, and three days later resurrected again. Will you call upon the name of the Lord to save you? It's the only way. We can't do it ourselves. It's only through Jesus Christ. I pray you'll make that decision today. Call out in your heart to God. Pray with me. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the message tonight. May we understand that You are in control. May we trust Your Word. May we wait upon You. May we know that You are God. May we be patient. May we grow during this storm, during this raging storm in our life. Just trust Your provision. Just trust Your plans, God, and know and believe Your promises. 
If anybody's been under this preaching and is, is, is the Holy Spirit is working on their heart for salvation, God, I pray, Lord, I pray that that spiritual battle will be won. Lord, I pray that they will, as your, as, uh, your will is that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God, my prayer is that they will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you and we thank you for him. We thank you for Jesus. It's in His precious holy name we do pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us again Wednesday night. Again, uh, my hope is that we're able to uh, join back together uh, as soon as possible. I'll keep you updated. Continue to pray. Um, God bless you. Reach out to each other. Encourage each other. Uh, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.